Every year, thousands and thousands of people vanish without leaving a single trace. For most, their disappearance remains unsolved until their case grows cold after countless years have passed by. However, in some cases, they are found again many decades later with stories so peculiar that it leads us to question the mysterious nature of this world we inhabit. Here is a list of some fascinating examples. People who went missing or were presumed dead, yet miraculously reappeared. Case 6. The Disappearance of Kamaya Mobley On the 10th of July, 1998, Shanera Mobley, who was 16 years old at the time, welcomed a vibrant little girl into the world in Jacksonville, Florida, and named her Kamaya. Despite her difficult life circumstances, Shanera viewed Kamaya's birth as an opportunity to turn things around and finally make something of herself. Shortly afterward, a woman dressed in scrubs walked through room 328 and met Shanera, who was with her daughter, and introduced herself as a nurse, but there was more to her than meets the eye. Unbeknownst to Shanera, this particular woman was feeling particularly hopeless that day after leaving her job at a Charleston nursing home. She was in an oppressive relationship. She'd been deprived custody of her children and, perhaps most distressing of all, she was reeling from a physical and mental trauma of having recently suffered a horrible miscarriage. Overwhelmed with postpartum depression, she drove to Florida's University Medical Center, stood outside the nursery for a few moments, and peered at all the newborns before walking into Shanera's room, where she found both mother and daughter. For hours, the woman remained by Shanera's side, offering her solace under the guise of being just a regular nurse. Eventually, she mentioned that it was time to take the infant out to measure her temperature. Instead, she stuffed baby Kamaya in a leather bag, walked out of the hospital, and drove far away. When her family members asked about where the baby came from, she lied about going into labor and subsequently giving birth at work. Back in Florida, Shanera was frantically calling out for her missing daughter. While police were able to construct a facial composite of the woman based on information provided by Shanera and other witnesses, the hunt for Kamaya's kidnapper bore no fruit. And as the years went by, with no new leads to speak of, what happened to Kamaya remained a mystery. Following a settlement with the former University Medical Center, Shanera was awarded $1.5 million in compensation due to the hospital's negligence. As for Kamaya, for 18 years, nobody knew her whereabouts, not even whether or not she was still alive. As Shanera Mobley labored to cobble together the pieces of her life following Kamaya's abduction, Gloria Williams, the woman responsible for Kamaya's kidnapping, found that things in her world began to fit back into place. She broke free of her abusive relationship, regained custody of her children, got remarried, and raised Kamaya as her own under a new name, Alexis Manigo. During her childhood in South Carolina, Alexis experienced a surprisingly cheerful upbringing. She was surrounded by family and friends, going to school, playing with her siblings, and regularly inviting friends over. As Alexis grew older and reached the age of 16, she unearthed a shocking secret kept hidden from her for many years. She didn't have a social security number, an essential requirement to get a driver's license or find work, and it became evident something wasn't quite right. It was then that Alexis confronted her so-called mother about it, who confessed that she had stolen her away as an infant. Even though Williams initially proposed to turn herself in, Alexis rejected the idea. Real or not, she wasn't about to lose the woman she viewed as her mother. January 2017, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children received two anonymous tips that eventually led them to Walterboro, one of which came from a friend who said Alexis had confessed to them. The other was a person who claimed they overheard Alexis talking about Gloria not being her real mother. After officers confronted Gloria and conducted DNA tests, it was proven beyond any doubt that Alexis Manigo was in fact 
Kamaya Mobley all along. When she heard the news, Shanera was filled with joy. Even though she went on to have more kids, her firstborn child never left her mind, nor her heart. When the two were eventually reunited, it wasn't precisely the joyful reunion Shanera always fantasized about. After all, for Alexis, Gloria Williams was her real mother. In February 2018, Williams pleaded guilty to kidnapping and interfering with custody under state law. During testimony at Williams' trial, Shanera spoke of the overwhelming grief she suffered after having her baby girl stolen from her. As for Williams, she conveyed nothing but remorse in her testimony. Unfortunately for her, this wasn't enough to sway the judge. Williams was found guilty and sentenced to 18 years behind bars. Despite what she's done, Kamaya refuses to cut ties with her other mother. In a heart-wrenching interview, 20 years after her daughter's kidnapping, Shanera Mobley revealed that she and Kamaya were no longer on speaking terms. Case 5. The Disappearance of Denise Bolser On January 17, 1985, 24-year-old Denise Desrousseau Bolser disappeared from her Raymond, New Hampshire abode. When her husband arrived home later that day, it took him six hours to notice the mysterious note pinned on their fridge, which read, We've got your wife. When police arrived, all they could find were footprints in the snow, yet no sign of Denise herself. After the note was left at Denise's home, no demand for a ransom or attempts to contact anyone were made, leaving no additional clues as to who wrote it or their intentions. After several days of investigation, police were eventually led to Logan Airport, where they stumbled upon her husband's pickup truck with Denisha's social security card, birth certificate, and credit cards placed on the front seat, yet Denise was nowhere to be found. Despite their best efforts, no clues could be found that could explain what happened to Denise or where she could have possibly gone. Her family, with whom she had a close bond, strongly suspected something sinister may have taken place when she suddenly left. Her husband was never suspected to have been involved with her disappearance, and he eventually filed for divorce. Law enforcement investigated the idea that she may have been abducted or possibly killed, yet concrete proof supporting this theory eluded them also. It wouldn't be until a few months after Denise's untimely disappearance that a new clue was uncovered. The courier service, where she had served as a bookkeeper, blamed her for stealing anywhere between $12,000 to $100,000, pointing to the possibility that she had gone into hiding due to financial troubles. In 1986, embezzlement charges were brought against Denise. Seven years later, the allegations against her were dismissed, and her family grew optimistic that she would one day reach out to them. In 2002, Shirley Casey, a private investigator, provided authorities with information regarding a woman living in Florida who fit Denise's description and shared her date of birth. Almost 17 years later, law enforcement was once again on Denise's trail, and on May 13, 2002, she was located in Panama City, Florida, now going by the name of Denise James. Unbeknownst to her old family, or anyone else for that matter, she had begun a new life and started a family for herself. When finally confronted, Denise confessed that her decision to flee was made after her ex-employer threatened to kill her within two days. Furthermore, Denise revealed that, while attempting to cover her tracks, she had gone to the Bahamas, California, South Carolina, and Hawaii. With the mystery solved, Denise was finally able to experience an emotional and joyous reunion with her family. Case 4 The Disappearance of John Darwin On the 14th of August, 1950, John Darwin was born in Hartlepool, a vibrant and bustling port town situated in County Durham, England. 23 years later, John married Anne Stephenson in Blackhall on December 22nd. He then went on to teach science and mathematics for 18 years before later becoming a prison officer. One day, on 21st of March 2002, John set out on a canoe ride 
and never returned home. And his wife was frantic when she noticed it had gone late and he still hadn't come back, prompting the police and Coast Guard to launch an expansive search in hopes of locating him. The following morning, the paddle John used during his voyage was found drifting in the ocean near Seton Carew. As for John, there were no clues to suggest where he was. Six weeks later, his dilapidated boat was located near North Gare in a secluded area known as the Blue Lagoon, situated by the River Tees. After six months of anguish and slowly losing hope of his survival, Anne stated that all she wanted was to bury John's body, as it would enable her to move on. In April of the subsequent year, Darwin was formally declared dead in an inquest with a concluded open verdict. His death certificate noted that the sea had claimed his life. With her husband's death certificate in hand, Anne was able to accumulate a grand total of nearly 250,000 pounds in payouts, consisting of a staggering 137,000 pounds from Norwich Union, an insurance company, his prison service pension worth 58,000 pounds, a life insurance policy worth 25,000 pounds, and his teacher's pension valued at 25,000 pounds. However, unbeknownst to anyone apart from his wife, John was alive and well. Throughout his constant job changes, from a teacher for 18 years to banking and finally prison officer, Darwin was driven by his never-ending quest for wealth. He remained confident that he would someday make it big. Ronald, his 91-year-old father, exclaimed, He had ideas above his station. He had big dreams and ambitions, and I sometimes think he was in too much of a hurry to make money. John Darwin was obsessed with the prospect of becoming a millionaire. Even at his mother's funeral, money was all he would talk about. At one point, he purchased numerous inexpensive properties in the Durham area in hopes of renting them out. When that didn't work out, he moved over to trading stocks. Soon enough, John had an astounding 17 phone lines installed in their house so that he could play the stock market during his leisure time although that endeavor also proved unsuccessful. Growing desperate, John tried to at least formulate an illusion of wealth by purchasing a 40,000-pound Range Rover. Behind the scenes, however, his investments had already gone astray and debt collectors came knocking at the couple's doorstep in 2001. Overwhelmed with debt but too prideful to declare bankruptcy, and unwilling to give up the prospect of coming out on top, Darwin devised a plan. He would stage his own death and collect the life insurance. Not long after his supposed death, Darwin went into hiding, but would frequently drop by his marital home, most often during the night. He would seclude himself in a small, one-roomed apartment adjacent to his own home and stay there during the day. Then at night, he made use of a hidden doorway concealed behind a wardrobe to gain access to his family's home without being seen or heard by anyone apart from his wife. Not even their own children knew that he was still alive. To ensure his presence remained undetected, Darwin poured concrete over the floorboards of the hidden passage to stifle any creaking. Gradually, Darwin grew bolder and more confident in this charade of his, he would stroll around in the daylight wearing nothing but a woolly hat and hobbling as if he was suffering from some sort of injury to conceal his identity. Should any visitors decide to drop by unannounced during one of his visits, he would disguise himself as Tom, the handyman, donning an inexpensive wig and glasses. Whenever relatives came to stay, he'd vanish through the same entrance behind his bedroom wardrobe. As time passed and Darwin became more confident that his deceitful plan had gone unnoticed, he applied for credit cards in his own name, utilizing none other than the address of his small hideout. Throughout his years of hiding, he was spotted plenty of times by different people who knew him personally. In 2003, Darwin chanced upon a former prison colleague, 
when police found out about this chance encounter, Anne managed to lie and convince police officers that the colleague had made a mistake and that the man he saw was just a cousin who looked just like John. One day, one of his tenants also recognized him when he passed by them and asked, Aren't you supposed to be dead? Darwin grew nervous and begged the man to not tell anyone, and the tenant reluctantly agreed. As a way of refabricating his identity, Darwin intently searched local cemeteries for the grave of a child born at roughly the same time as himself, then applied for a copy of their birth certificate, only to use it to secure a passport. After contriving yet another ambitious plan, he utilized his passport to journey to America in 2004, where he had made contact with Kelly Steele, a mother of three from Kansas, through an online role-playing game. He also persuaded Kelly to purchase a 20-acre ranch using 25,000 pounds of his own money. Darwin reportedly lied to her about having made a fortune on the stock market and told her that he always wanted to become a cowboy. Shortly after his arrival at the U.S., his tone quickly shifted when he began aggressively demanding his money back from Kelly, sending her sinister emails that left her fearing for her safety. John Darwin then continued to pursue his ambitions of becoming a multi-millionaire. He flew to Panama City, where he managed to start a company. He later bought a lavish 25,000-pound Toyota Land Cruiser along with the 50,000-pound flat. After successfully selling two properties in Seton Carew for a collective sum of 455,000 pounds, he made the decision to invest an additional 200,000 pounds into a sprawling estate near the Panama Canal, which he planned on turning into a tourist resort. In the meantime, police had already been tipped off that he might be still alive and living in Panama. The lies further started to unravel on 14th of July, 2006, when a picture of him and his wife, property hunting in Panama, was posted. When Panama began implementing new visa regulations, Darwin knew that his identity would now have to go through a lengthy approval process, and this time, he couldn't rely on his alias to keep him hidden. He then constructed another of his devious ploys. He decided to return home and pretend to be afflicted with amnesia. On the evening of December 1st, 2007, 57-year-old John Darwin walked into the West End Central Police Station with an astonishing confession. He declared, I think I am a missing person. He was able to provide his name, date of birth, and other identifying information with ease. However, he stated that he could not recall where he had been in the past five and a half years. In an effort to get to the bottom of where Darwin's been over the past five and a half years, Cleveland Police and the Metropolitan Police joined forces for a collaborative investigation. Anne, who was completely overwhelmed with joy, took to the media to express her excitement at her husband's survival. Due to the aforementioned Panama photo, and thanks to the numerous individuals who Darwin was spotted by over the years, police were able to put together evidence that invalidated his plea of amnesia and brought him in front of a judge. In 2008, after confessing to eight deception charges, Darwin was convicted and incarcerated for a sentence of six years and three months. His wife, Anne, was also charged with fraud and money laundering, later receiving a sentence of six and a half years. Case 3 the Disappearance of Stephen Kubaki On a cold winter day in February 1978, 23-year-old Stephen Kubaki, an undergraduate student at Hope College, a quaint and intimate Christian college located by the shores of Lake Michigan, inexplicably disappeared without a trace. Stephen decided to go on a daring skiing journey alone, planning to stay one or two days, but never came back. The day after his excursion, snowmobilers in Sagatuck noticed Stephen's cross-country skis discarded with a backpack near them and quickly reached out to law enforcement. Upon examining the contents of this pack, they concluded 
that it belonged to Stephen, prompting an immediate search and rescue mission for him. The trail of 200 yards he left in the snow went past the lake's edge, then abruptly ended. This led investigators to conclude that Kubaki, more than likely, met his fate under a thick layer of ice and drowned. The mysterious Lake Michigan Triangle, spanning Manitowoc, Wisconsin to Ludington, Michigan, and down to Benton Harbor, is where Stephen had gone missing. This unforgiving landscape of the U.S. is steeped in mystery. The Lake Michigan Triangle may not be as famous as the Bermuda Triangle, but is certainly just as terrifying. In 1891, the seven-man crew of a schooner named Thomas Hume set out to sail across the lake in search of lumber, but they never returned, and no trace of their vessel was ever found. Many other unexplained flight mishaps, ghost ship sightings, disappearances, and weather conditions that go from one extreme to the other in a matter of minutes have been attributed to this eerie region since then. After Stephen went missing, search teams combed the area he was last seen in. Eventually, they found his skis and poles on the lake's beach, as well as footsteps leading up to his frozen surface. There was no sign of Stephen's body. It was as if he had vanished into the ether. On the 5th of May, 1979, 14 and a half months since his ill-fated trip, Stephen returned to his father's house and simply rang the doorbell. He seemed disoriented, as if he had just woken up from a really long nap, and was in utter disbelief that it had been more than a year. After his father embraced him, Stephen recalled having a faint memory of what happened during his absence. He was jolted awake in a meadow almost 40 miles from his father's house and 700 miles from Lake Michigan. He was dressed in weird clothes, and beside him was an unfamiliar backpack containing maps that did not belong to him. He was also entirely unaware of the events that led up to this peculiar predicament. What is, perhaps, most intriguing about Stephen's case is what he was wearing, a t-shirt from a Wisconsin marathon. He remarked in an interview that, I feel like I've done a lot of running. As for his last memories, they were of the snow-capped shores of Lake Michigan. The mysterious events surrounding Stephen's disappearance remain an unsolved riddle to this day. Some think he simply went into a coma and wandered aimlessly across the country, while others believe he fell victim to the Lake Michigan Triangle, an area with no shortage of unexplainable phenomenon. Some wilder theories even suggest that aliens kidnapped him for experimentation. Again and again, reporters questioned Stephen on what happened to him, to which he responded that he really didn't recall much of anything. Despite all of this, he remained insistent on the fact that he had no mental health issues to speak of. During a later interview, he revealed details of his abrupt disappearance and discussed what might have been behind it all. He reasoned his blackout was likely due to fatigue or overexposure and revealed that he would be seeing a physician for a checkup, but he emphatically refused any form of psychiatrist counseling. My father was going to sign over the house to me. I had three courses at school and no trouble. I left the romance in Germany. There was no trouble with girls. I had a job lined up with the Holland Sentinel newspaper. Presently, Kubaki is alive and well in the Pacific Northwest, where he works as a psychologist, an admittedly amusing twist of fate. Case 2. The Disappearance of Tamara Milograd On a blissful Saturday morning on September 18, 1971, 15-year-old Tamara Milograd and two of her closest friends made their way to the nearby city of Melbourne, where the renowned Royal Melbourne Show was taking place, an eagerly anticipated annual carnival event. The carnival brought together farmers, food, and entertainment, drawing in hundreds of thousands of people annually. Before that, going to the carnival, Tamara informed her fretful mother, Rubel, of her plans to attend the exhibition with some of her classmates. When Rubel heard there would be many people present, she wanted to accompany Tamara and her friends to keep an eye on things. However, 
Tamara seemed fiercely opposed to this idea, pointing out that she and her friends can look out for one another and that her mom wouldn't be interested in the games. After a hasty farewell to her mother, Tamara hopped in the car with friends for an exciting day at the bustling exhibition. Sheep sharing and horse racing were just a few of the captivating activities available. Alpaca displays, poultry competitions, log chopping events, and more were also within arm reach for the kids to enjoy. As they walked around the carnival, Tamara, who up to this point seemed disinterested and uneasy, informed her friends that she was going to look for a place to exchange some money as she was out of change, promising to return shortly. Anxiety swirled among her friends as Tamara's absence grew worryingly extended. After a while, they began to look for Tamara in places where she might have gone, yet there was no sign of her. Desperately scouring for someone, Tamara's friends had no choice but to frantically call her family. Her parents rushed to the venue immediately and, after hours of fruitless search efforts, soon realized there was no sign of her anywhere on the premises. Without delay, they swiftly alerted Australian authorities of the situation. Police officers escalated the search efforts to encompass nearby areas of the exhibition. Yet, after days of tirelessly looking for her, there was no sign of 15-year-old Tamara. After delving into her personal relationships with her parents, police uncovered that Tamara was going through a period of adolescent rebellion. Additionally, Eugene, Tamara's older brother, said that she was a handful before vanishing. Tamara was highly introverted, often skipped school, and the tension between her and her family members became unbearable at times. In fact, she once escaped through her bedroom window for days on end before finally returning home. Furthermore, Tamara's closest friends informed the police that shortly before she vanished, there was a heated argument between her and her family about going out with her boyfriend. After this altercation, Tamara would be frequently heard talking about fleeing her home and starting a new life. Nonetheless, police began searching for witnesses who may have spotted Tamara. Meanwhile, Tamara's family launched a multifaceted campaign, distributing printouts throughout the streets and shopping malls in hopes that someone may recognize Tamara or have valuable information regarding her disappearance. In the ensuing months, police learned from several eyewitnesses that Tamara was spotted a few days after she went missing. Some witnesses claimed that Tamara had been lurking in the stables at the fair for two days following her mysterious disappearance. Yet, after arriving on the premises, police officers found no trace of her. It was also rumored that Tamara had been working in a bar near the waterfront of St. Kilda, an area located on Melbourne's southern side. Additionally, a friend of Tamara's allegedly caught sight of her at a hotel in Laverton. This, along with Tamara's complicated relationship with her family, prompted the authorities to presume that she indeed departed of her own free will. Nevertheless, her family refused to give up their search for her. They hired a private investigator to look into Tamara's possible whereabouts and even traveled to every place where she was rumored to be spotted, yet returned empty-handed every time. Throughout the years, despite the passage of time and their daughter's case growing cold, her parents held on to their hope that Tamara would one day come back. After 18 years of agonizing over Tamara's disappearance, her father tragically passed away without ever finding out the truth. In 2010, Melbourne launched its Missing Persons Week, and among the stories shared was Tamara's. In 2015, a woman stumbled upon Tamara's picture whilst browsing the AFP Missing Persons website and saw a woman that looked an awful lot like her own mother, the only difference being her mom had a different name. Corina Russell suffered the loss of her mother in a car accident in 1976 when she was but a few years old. Later in life, Corina found out that her father and mother never wed, as for some reason, her mother couldn't get a birth certificate. This piqued Corina's curiosity, and she began looking for answers regarding her mother's real identity. 
There were remarkable similarities between Pauline Tammy Russell, her mother, and Tamara Milograd. Apart from sharing the same birthday, the resemblance was also uncanny. Corina reached out to the National Missing Persons Coordination Center and told them she thought the woman from the photo could be her mother. Unbeknownst to her, the information she was about to discover would alter her life in a monumental way. To determine if Pauline Tammy Russell was, in fact, Tamara Milligrad, Tamara's family was contacted and a DNA sample from one of her siblings was collected. The results were analyzed by an expert from the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, who verified that the DNA sample provided was a match with Karina's own genetic material. After an astonishing 44 years of not knowing what happened to Tamara, her family was, at last, able to uncover the truth. Not only did Tamara sever all ties with her previous family, but she also moved elsewhere in Victoria and changed both her age to 18 and named to Pauline Tammy Russell, having two kids afterward before tragically losing her life in a car crash. After four long decades, Tamara's family finally got the closure they had been searching for. Although it was agonizing for Tamara's now 90-year-old mother to discover what became of her daughter, finally learning the fate of her beloved 15-year-old child may have proved comforting to some extent. Tamara's family was finally able to leave the past in their way, and her bittersweet outcome ensued. As for Karina, Tamara's family welcomed her into the fold with open arms. Case 1. The Disappearance of Lucy Ann Johnson Lucy Ann Johnson, formerly Lucy Ann Carvel, was born on October 14, 1935, in Skagway, Alaska. Lucy lived out her early childhood in the cities of Bennett and Pennington before her family moved to the Yukon community of Carcross, where she was eight years old. It wasn't until 1953 that she left Carcross, however, and after doing so, there wasn't much contact between Lucy and her relatives. In 1954, Lucy met Marvin Johnson. The couple fell in love and soon tied the knot before relocating to Surrey in British Columbia, Canada. While Lucy found a job at a hospital, Marvin worked on a tugboat, and together they made ends meet for their two children, Linda and Daniel. Life working on a tugboat can be full of hardship, hardship that Marvin sought refuge from via alcohol. Before long, the already short-tempered Marvin no longer had control over his actions and would often lash out or sometimes even assault Lucy. Linda, Lucy's daughter, later mentioned that she didn't recall her father ever being explicitly violent, but he implied he was physically abusive towards her mother. One day in 1961, Lucy suddenly disappeared without a trace. However, it took Marvin until 1965 to report her missing, four years after she had been gone. It was only after police confronted him about it after receiving an anonymous tip from one of the neighbors who were worried that they hadn't seen Lucy in quite some time. When police officers questioned him, Marvin reaffirmed what the neighbor had already told them, that Lucy's been gone since 1961. Initially, authorities suspected foul play when one of the neighbors recalled seeing Marvin digging in his backyard. However, Upon inspecting the premises, police officers failed to uncover anything, meaning there was insufficient proof to accuse Marvin of murdering his wife. In any case, DNA samples from Lucy's kids were taken and would later routinely be evaluated for similarities in unidentified bodies, yet no matches were ever found. After his wife had been gone for some time, Marvin became reluctant to utter her name. Later on, he remarried and prohibited Linda and Daniel from mentioning their mother in any capacity whatsoever. Unfortunately, Lucy's son, Daniel, passed away in his late teens. As for Linda, despite her mother disappearing when she was only seven years old, she went on to live a fulfilling life, later marrying and becoming a grandmother of ten. 
In 2013, Lucy's disappearance went on to become one of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police's oldest and most enduring cold cases. Five decades later, Linda, who was in her 50s by now, slowly began resigning herself to the fact that Lucy was gone forever. But before relinquishing all hope, she decided to try something no one thought would work. Hoping to locate her mother, whom she knew was from Alaska, Linda placed an ad in the Yukon News. The advertisement contained Lucy's full name as well as her date of birth, birthplace, and the names of her parents. This was, by all means, a last-ditch effort to, at the very least, find some closure. What happened next, however, wasn't what Linda was expecting. After a few weeks, an astonishing phone call came to Rhonda Glenn in Whitehorse, Yukon. Her brother, Howard, was working when he noticed something profoundly strange. An advertisement was placed by someone searching for their mother, who shared the same name and personal info as their own mom. This left Rhonda dumbfounded. Rhonda gave in to curiosity and eventually contacted Linda. As soon as Rhonda and Linda began speaking on the phone, a connection between them was palpable. As the two conversed with one another, they began to slowly realize, without a shadow of a doubt, that they were related. Excited, Linda quickly began making preparations for a trip that was long overdue. As she stepped off the plane in Whitehorse, she was welcomed with open arms by a large gathering of family members she never knew she had. Her half-sister, Rhonda, half-brother, and two aunts were all eagerly awaiting to meet outside the airport's fenced area. Among the family, none was more excited to see Linda than Lucy, who immediately recognized her daughter despite having never seen her for more than 50 years. As it turned out, Lucy Ann Johnson was alive and well in 2013, more than five decades after she vanished. She had stayed put in British Columbia until the 1980s before moving to the Yukon Territory. After remarrying and giving birth to four kids, Lucy explained that her disappearance hadn't been intentional, but rather circumstantial, a claim which ended up vindicating her former husband, Marvin, who passed away during the 1990s from all accusations related to his alleged involvement in her vanishing act. Upon being questioned regarding her disappearance, Lucy confessed that it had to do with Marvin's abusive behavior and that she attempted to take her kids with her, but Marvin wouldn't let them go. After finding out about her mother, Linda still had to deal with everything that happened. Even though it was tough, she said that she wasn't mad at her mother and hoped that Lucy would want to meet her great-grandchildren. In an interview, Linda stated that she still had a lot of questions, but is mostly hoping for the best and that her family could be welcomed into her mother's life. While much of the world's secrets remain hidden in plain sight, it's comforting to know that at least some of its mysteries get solved when all the puzzle pieces are put together. What do you think about these cases? Got any suggestions for a future video? Let us know in the comments down below.